Everything you ever wanted to know about fluoride is covered in this exclusive PrisonPlanet.tv interview with Dr. Paul Conant, co-author of The Case Against Fluoride. He covers the history of fluoridation, the collusion of major industries to put certified toxic waste into your drinking water, why the government agencies refuse to conduct scientific studies, and how he and others across North America are trying to end this barbaric practice. You will never look at tap water the same way again. Hello, my name is Paul Connett, uh, Professor Paul Connett. I taught chemistry for 23 years at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York. My speciality was environmental chemistry and toxicology. Before that, I got my PhD in chemistry from Dartmouth and my undergraduate degree from Cambridge University in England. For 25 years, uh, I was very much involved with waste management. 14 years ago, my wife persuaded me to get involved in the fluoridation debate. I didn't want to because I was very busy with these teaching chemistry and waste management. But my wife is very persuasive and I looked at it. Now, up to that point, I thought the people opposed to fluoridation were a bunch of wackos. But when I started reading the literature, I was shocked and embarrassed. Embarrassed because I'd been persuaded that people opposed to fluoridation were a little strange. And shocked because some of the information there is extremely disturbing. For about a hundred years, we know we're slow learners, uh, for about a hundred years the phosphate fertilizer industry which takes phosphate rock and heats it up with sulfuric acid to make soluble phosphate for fertilizers. The rock is not soluble and to use it as fertilizer you've got to make it into a soluble product. They heat it up with sulfuric acid and that drives off two gases, hydrogen fluoride and silicon tetrafluoride. These two gases decimated the vegetation in the areas of these plants. They crippled cattle. The cattle came down with skeletal fluorosis. We have pictures of this, videotapes of this. And in, in Florida, it damaged the citrus groves in the close proximity of the plants. So after 100 years, they said, whoops, a daisy, I think we should remove those toxic gases. So they put a wet scrubber in, and all it consisted of was a spray of water. And that spray of water converts these toxic gases into a solution called hexafluorosilicic acid. And now Kafka takes over. I think the most important thing to recognize about fluoride is that it's extremely toxic. It is very active biologically, interfering with many basic biochemical processes, uh, enzymes, G proteins, hydrogen bonds, and so on. So it shouldn't surprise us that there's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. But the bottom line is that fluoride is extremely active biologically, that the first opponents of fluoridation going back to the 1950s were biochemists, inclu including scientists like James Sumner, who won a, a Nobel Prize for enzyme chemistry. And incidentally, there is no doubt that fluoride damages health because millions of people in India, China, and parts of Africa have had their health ruined by fluoride. The people have been crippled by fluoride and many other health effects. The argument, as far as fluoridation is concerned, is is there an adequate margin of safety between the doses which cause this known harm and incidentally documented in this report by the National Research Council published in 2006 here, a in, uh, fairly independent, balanced panel looked at the literature for three years, and in this 507-page report and 1,100 references, indicated that the EPA safe drinking water standard for fluoridation for fluoride is four parts per million. It's not safe. It's not protective of health, and needs to be lowered. But before I get into the health effects, let me explain my first concern, which remains my top concern. The level of fluoride in mother's milk, mother's breast milk, baby's first meal, is extremely low. It's 0 0.004 parts per million. That means a bottle-fed baby in a fluoridated community in the United States, where we fluoridate the water at one part per million, is getting 250 times higher dose of fluoride than a breastfed baby. And that is extremely disturbing. This is a hazardous waste, no question about it. It's not only hexafluorosilicic, 
acid, but it's a lot of crap that Neil was talking about. It's got lead and arsenic and mercury and radioactive uh, isotopes, maybe trace amounts. They can't dump that into the sea by international law. They can't dump it locally because it's too concentrated. But wait for it. If someone buys it from them, it's, it, it, you take away the label hazardous waste and it becomes a product. It becomes a product. And who's going to buy this stuff from them? Oh, our water department. So the water departments buy this hazardous waste, it becomes a product, and now they put it in our drinking water. And now, let me go through the list of health concerns. Some of them are more certain than others. Let me begin with the certain one. Dental fluorosis. Fluoride causes a discoloration, mottling of the tooth enamel. When this practice began in 1945, the promoters of fluoridation thought they could limit dental fluorosis to 10% of the children in its very mild form. And the very mild form has little specks of, of uh, white opaque patches on the cusp of the teeth, up to 25%. And they thought that only dentists would notice this and was an acceptable trade-off with what they thought would be a lowering of tooth decay. Well, in November of 2010, the Center of Disease Control told us that children aged 12 to 15 in the United States, 41% of them now have dental fluorosis. And not only the very mild, but the mild, which impacts up to 50% of the tooth surface, moderate, which impacts up to 100% of the tooth surface, and severe, where you not only have the whole surface impacted, but indentations, chipping of the teeth, and so on. And 3.6% of children aged 12 to 15 in the United States have either moderate or severe dental fluorosis. So that, that trade-off between lowering tooth decay and um, producing dental fluorosis but holding it only to 10% clearly was a failure. We have four times more dental fluorosis as intended and as desired. Our attitude is that when you see this dental fluorosis, it means the child has been overexposed to fluoride, and the question is what other tissues have been affected. So let's start with the bone, because the teeth are a window into the bone. In fact, the teeth actually grow out of the, the jaw, the jaw bone. And by the time the permanent teeth have come out, the jaw bone has been loaded up with fluoride. And so if you can see the damage to the growing tooth cells, what did the fluoride do to the growing bone cells during this 8, 9, 10 period? In fact, the first study that was published on this in 55 indicated that the children in the fluoridated community, which was Newburgh, New York, had twice as much uh, cortical bone defects as the children in the non-fluoridated community. Now, the cortical bone is the outside layer of the bone, and that's the layer, it's a lamellar structure, and that part of the bone is meant to protect against fractures. And so the, the, the concern then is whether we're increasing bone fractures in children. Well, we had to wait until 2001 before someone investigated this, and the researchers in Mexico found a linear a correlation as the severity of dental fluorosis went up meaning the amount of fluoride the child had been exposed to before the permanent teeth had erupted. As that went up, so did bone fractures in the children. And it was quite striking. When you go from no dental fluorosis to very mild dental fluorosis, it doubled. The, the bone fractures doubled. Very mild to mild, doubled again. Mild to moderate, doubled again. The next concern about bone is that the first symptoms of bone poisoning in an adult are just like arthritis, uh, stiff joints, pains in the joints, pains in the bone. In the United States, we have one in three adults now with some form of arthritis. And if you ask a doctor what's causing it, um, they will say, well, we don't really know, but we think it's got something to do with aging. Well, what also parallels aging, of course, is the number of years you spent in a fluoridated community, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, uh, eventually 60, 70, and so on. 
The next concern is, is as the fluoride continues to build up in the bone, and I should say that up to 50% of all the fluoride that we take in each day accumulates in the bone, the fluoride is bioaccumulative, um, the bones get more brittle. And another major concern is increased hip fractures in adults. A study is done in China as documented in this National Research Council report and we further elaborated in our book, The Case Against Fluoride, indicates that levels as low as three milligrams per day, that's three liters of fluoridated water per day, may increase hip fractures in the elderly. Now my major concern is not the bones, although I think that's significant, my major concern is the brain. Because when the baby is born, the blood-brain barrier is not fully formed. We think the blood-brain barrier keeps fluoride out of the brain most of the time, but for the first half year of the baby's life, the fluoride can get into the brain. And this is not the time, in my view, and the view of many other scientists, that a baby should be exposed to fluoride at 250 times the level in mother's milk. There have now been over 100 animal studies which shows that fluoride damages the brain. There have also been 23 IQ studies, most of them from China, but one from India, one from Iran, and one from Mexico, which show an association between moderate exposure to fluoride and lowered IQ in children. And I actually vi visited the villages where one of these studies was done. It was a very good study. They controlled for lead. They controlled for iodine. Most of the, the villages were almost the two villages were almost identical, except for the fact that their well water was different. And the author of this study estimated that the f IQ would be lowered at 1.9 parts per million. And that offers no adequate margin of safety for children drinking water at one parts per million when you consider the massive range of sensitivity to any toxic effect and the fact that once you put fluoride in the water you can't control the dose. Another concern which many of us have had for many years is fluoride's impact on the thyroid glands. For between the 30s and the 50s doctors in Argentina, France and Germany were giving patients with hyper thyroidism, overactive thyroid gland, sodium fluoride tablets to lower thyroid function. And the doses that they were using were between 2.5 and 4.5 milligrams per day, which is exceeded by many people drinking fluoridated water. For example, the Institute of Medicine actually advises people to drink three liters of water a day. So clearly then they would be in the range for lowered thyroid function. And once again, as in many of these other issues, the fluoridating countries, including the United States, are simply not doing the studies. They're not investigating to see if there's a relationship between fluoridation and lowered IQ, fluoridation and arthritis, fluoridation and hypothyroidism. Key health studies have not been done in fluoridated countries. If you don't look, you don't find. They would like to imply, because they don't see anything, there's nothing wrong, but if they're not looking, they won't find. You often hear the promoters say things like, oh, we've been doing this for 60 years. If there's any problem, we would know about it by now. Oh, no, you wouldn't unless you were doing the studies. Another issue that came out in 1997 was a researcher in England found that fluoride accumulated in the human pineal gland, and the pineal gland is a little gland between the two parts of the brain, the two hemispheres of the brain. It's not protected by the blood-brain barrier. It has a high perfusion rate of blood, and it also is a calcifying tissue like the teeth and the bones. And so this researcher hypothesized that fluoride would be attracted to this tissue, this little gland, like a magnet. And sure enough, when she investigated the average level of fluoride on these little calcium hydroxyapatite crystals was 9,000 parts per million, up to 21,000 parts per million, which means that this little gland has a higher concentration of fluoride than any other tissue in the body, including the bone. This researcher, Jennifer Luke, also did animal studies. And in the animal studies, she found that fluoride lowered the production of melatonin, the hormone that this little gland